Happy Easter, one and all, and this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Don't have a lot of announcements. Um, one in particular, uh, Gwen Wyatt asked me to pass on to you. She uh, had surgery on Friday and expected to be hospitalized for a couple of days, and lo and behold, <laughs> turned into a same-day surgery because everything went so well. So she is back home uh, here in Cary, and all is good. So we will remember her in prayer today. Also, um, when it comes to our service today, thank you all for sitting politely and being masked. And uh, so for those of you who haven't been here in a while, with the congregation's permission, I just go ahead and set up the, uh, my computer so that we can record things. So I want to say welcome also to those who are worshiping with us on this Easter Sunday virtually. And we're glad you're back with us again. So, without further note, Liz, something about flowers. Three lilies and one yellow tulip that have not been spoken for if anybody wants it. And please, because I dare not take anything like that again. I catch that. <laughs> so, by all means, you can reach out. So, let's take a moment and prepare ourselves to worship the Lord. Oh, uh -huh. 
I invite you to stand and join with me with the confession and forgiveness as printed in your bulletin. Trusting in the word of life given in baptism, we are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By our baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ, God raised us to new life. Let us confess to God our sins and all that waits for resurrection in our lives. God of love, we find it hard to believe the witness of the resurrection. We resist your unfailing love for us and for others, and we turn our backs to the gift of new life, choosing instead the old way of sin, the way that takes us away from you and leads us back toward death. Free us from this power of sin. Guide us by your Spirit, and help us in our weakness, that we may live as your children, restored to new and everlasting life. Amen. By God's grace, you are forgiven, and you are born anew in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May you be strengthened daily with the power to walk in God's light, and his love. Amen. Share together with our entrance hymn, Jesus Christ is risen today. I invite you to stand for our opening verses of prayer for the day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory be to God our high. Glory to the Father. 
Glory be to the Son, our Savior. Glory be to the Son. Glory be to the Spirit who makes us one. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Peace to all the world. Amen. Let's join our hearts and our voices together in the prayer of the day. O God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ and help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, I can't do that. <clears throat> Our first reading, a little bit of a change from the way we've uh, usually done Easter's. I actually included an Old Testament prophecy. This is from the 25th chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the 6th verse. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading, which is often used as the first reading on Easter Sunday, uh, actually comes after the resurrection. It comes after the ascension. It actually comes after the coming of the Holy Spirit. But it is when Peter stands before folks at the home of a uh, Roman soldier. And Peter begins to speak to them. And he says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth <clears throat> with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. This is the Holy Gospel for this Easter Sunday according to St. John, the 20th chapter. 
Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid them, laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Oh, a hundred years ago, before I was ordained and I was doing my internship, my supervising pastor gave me a litany of time management. The first thing you have to ask is, does this need to be done? That's the first question. And if the answer is no, then what are you doing it for? You may want to, but that's about leisure time. Does this need to be done? If the answer is yes, then you go on to the second stage. Does this need to be done by me? If the answer is no, delegate it to someone who has maybe a little more time. But if the answer is yes, it needs to be done by me, then you move on to the next question. Does it need to be done now? If the answer is yes, do it. If the answer is no, Pick a time when you will do it. I was thinking about that as uh, as Sharon and I uh, recently heard from Jack and his wife, Marianne, 
And I was reminded of that procedure because through the course of this past year, um, it has been a struggle to stay on task. I don't know what all you've been going through, but it's a challenge. There are so many things that are requiring so much attention to adapt to our present situation, not only in this country, but in the world as well. Mary and those who were with Jesus at the crucifixion knew that it was the Sabbath and having asked permission, had removed the body. We heard that part of the story Friday night as we concluded our, our Good Friday worship with the reading of the Passion story. And the very last thing was that Jesus was laid in the tomb because it was the beginning of Passover. The women who would have been the ones to tend to things properly, would have uh, uh, anointed the body with spices, those sorts of things that would cover up the stench of death. I don't know whether you've ever had the opportunity, I hope not too many of you have, to, uh, to discover someone who has been dead for some time because it is not a pleasant odor. Mary knew this needs to be done, and she knew it needed to be done by her, but she knew she could not do it and break the Sabbath. And so she waited until this morning. Now Mark, and Mark is very, very abrupt. He doesn't really have much but Matthew and Luke, on the other hand, do. And they talk about not just Mary, but also the other Mary and uh, who were the other two? Some kind of pastor I am. I can't even, I don't have scripture memorized. But you see, they're all going to the tomb to do those things that were necessary to anoint Jesus and to prevent the stench of death. That's what was going on. But Mary arrives at the tomb to do at the time that she could for Jesus, as was the custom. Now, Matthew and Luke also talk about with the women discussing who will roll away the stone, so on and so forth. But the truth be told, that part is superfluous to what Mary discovers. She gets there. She looks. Stone is gone. Jesus' body is gone. She scurries away. She tells the disciples, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what has happened here. So Peter and the other disciple take off. They want to go check this out for themselves. Now again, in the other Gospels, some just simply regarded this as an idle tale. I mean, come on, who wants to take the word of a woman? you got to have the men verify it. I say that in jest, ladies. I really do. So off they go, and they go and they look for themselves, and they look inside the tomb, things there. But John finds it important to identify that the linens which had been wrapped around the body are now neatly folded and on the place where Jesus' body was laid, except for the shroud that covered his head which was rolled up neatly and elsewhere on that slab, if you will, that is in the tomb. With all of that detail and everything else aside, they flee. They go back to wherever their homes were. Uh, again, if you compare it to the other Gospels, they return to be with the other disciples. But here comes the quintessential moment, in my eyes, 
of just what the resurrection is all about. Mary stays around. Mary continues to be there at the tomb. Mary is the one who perhaps still can't believe this. She looks and she looks inside and there's two angels who are in white right where Jesus' body had been laid. She's crying. We all know what that's like. We lose a loved one and it causes us to weep. Sometimes it causes us to weep weeks, months, even years after our loved one has passed. Why are you weeping? But Mary responds through her grief and loss of Jesus, they have taken away my Lord. Don't you realize it? You're sitting where he was just lying just two days ago when we put him into the tomb. They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have laid him. Now, maybe it's in the anguish of grief. Maybe it's in the, in the midst of her own suffering and her own curiosity, like, where did the body go? That Mary begins to wonder. She sees a figure standing. That figure, John tells us, is Jesus, but Mary could not recognize him. That's an important feature. All too often, we look around ourselves in this day when we move from one place to another, and we don't always recognize Jesus standing in our midst. Going back to my opening story, does this need to be done by me? And all too often I say, yes, it needs to be done by me. When the truth is, when I choose to do it myself, I deprive others of their ministry. Someone who wants to pitch in, someone who wants to help, someone who wants to do for their Lord as I want to do for my Lord day in and day out. We need to look and pay attention so that we can embrace others' offers to help, to help us in our moment of need, to help us learn something new that we never knew before, to allow ourselves to be embraced by God working through another person to help us in our in our hour of need. But Jesus says to her, Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Well, she was just asked that question. And so she says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. It's at this point that Jesus calls her by name. I want you to hear Jesus calling you by name in those moments when someone reaches out to help you. When you, in the midst of your grief and your suffering and your pain, have someone who calls you by name. That's all Jesus had to do was speak the name. And at once, she recognized who Jesus was. And she calls him by that, that title of Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher, I know it's you. Thanks be to God. But then something interesting happened. Jesus says to her, do not hold on to me, because I have yet not ascended.
to the Father. You see, when it comes to this point in this gospel announcement that Christ is alive, he is raised, he is risen indeed, comes this proclamation from Jesus, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. In that simple phrase, Jesus reminds Mary, reminds us that we are not to cling to the earthly Jesus where that life ended. Did you get that? We are not to cling to the earthly Jesus, the one for whom life ended, but we are to cling to the resurrected, ascended Lord, who is now with the Father eternally until, as he promised, I will come again. And so we do not cling to the earthly Jesus, but we are clung to by the risen Christ who will come again. And that's the fullness of the gospel. Over the course of the next six Sundays, plus Pentecost, we are going to experience various times and ways in which Jesus comes to be among his disciples, to be among his people and his followers. Much as Peter uh, preached in our second reading this morning, and he comes and endows us with the promised Holy Spirit so that we can follow his example to be with and for others, to be one who listens and responds, one who takes on the challenges of this world and has a vision beyond, a vision of that day when all will be raised from the dead, when all will be united, one with Christ as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. On that day, when Jesus' resurrection becomes our resurrection and our eternal life. I don't know about you, but when I lost a loved one, it's hard to let go. It's hard to let go because that presence with us continues to remain in the love that we received from that person. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it is someone who walked this journey with us in true faith. That grief does continue as we remember, but that grief is overcome through the true hope that comes from faith. Mary believed it. Peter and the other disciple believed it. You and me, do we believe it today? Will we believe it tomorrow? And will we continue in that faith, looking forward to that glorious resurrection, where one with God in Christ eternally we will dwell to the glory of God the Father. Mary Magdalene left, and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. I pray God touches you this day with the vision of faith to see the risen Christ standing before you and calling you by name, raising you up in the promise of hope of everlasting life. Amen.
I invite you to stand and join with me as we profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Praise to you for your power revealed in the resurrection. Fill your church with the power of your love that is stronger than death. Send us to tell the good news wherever death holds sway. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you make yourself known in your creation. In mountains and valleys, in plants and animals, and in those who care for what you have made. Lead us and all your creatures to proclaim that this is the day that the Lord has made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Together we pray that the world may be delivered from oppression, terror, and violence, and be filled with the peace that Christ gave. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You give life to those in need by the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Comfort those who suffer, encourage those who care for the sick, bind up the brokenhearted, and wipe away the tears of all who mourn. We also on this day ask a special measure of your grace to be poured out especially for Kevin and Jay, Gwen, Sue, Denise, Nancy, Jackie, Paul, and those whom we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In grace, we pray for those joyfully gathered here by your Spirit. Give us words to boldly proclaim Christ crucified and risen. Be all visitors here today with your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You give life to your saints by setting a banquet table of rich food. Feed us with the bread of life and bring us with all your saints to the feast that has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
We are about to move into the portion of our service wherein we say we share the sacrament of Holy Communion, and we uh, obviously are going to do that uh, in the way we have the last couple of times. Everyone will remain stationary. I will, just for reasons of clarity, be giving you um, some words as we go along as to when we actually take the sacrament and those things. One of the things that is in our, um, I, I guess for lack of better word, the, the, the constitution of our congregation is that sacrament be conducted in a right and proper order. And so listen and especially dwell on the words that are shared as we come together in this holy sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Offer thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Today, by your grace, we share in this blessed sacrament. Renewed in the gift of baptism, we come to the fullness of your grace. So with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their many words of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The risen Christ invites us to this table. Come, eat, and be satisfied. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And at this point in the service, you should have your bag filled with the elements of the communion as well as the napkin. I think the altar guild decided to use the napkin because they know Pastor Bill can get a little sloppy once in a while. You will find there are two ends. One is larger, one is smaller. One contains the wine, the other has the bread on the bottom. If you'll open the smaller diameter end and remove the covering, you'll find in there a small wafer. 
Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Now, if you'll turn it over to a larger diameter, carefully remove that covering, you will find the one. They can drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Now I invite you to stand for the blessing and also for the prayer and the benediction. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us, and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, dear friends, may our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus. May the God of life Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.
Please stand. Now, dear friends, go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.